Hi, this is Ken James from the New College of the Humanities. I'm giving this small presentation on theory of knowledge in the natural sciences. It's helpful to separate the formal sciences from the natural sciences and then the human sciences. The formal sciences, the paradigm examples being logic, mathematics and geometry, typically proceed by the means of axioms and then deductive proofs from axioms. The formal sciences do not have any particular empirical or observational content. The natural sciences, on the other hand, paradigm examples being physics, chemistry and biology, have clear empirical content and do not proceed by merely formal means and often cannot even be clearly axiomatized. And lastly, we have the human sciences. The human sciences t tend to contain even less formalism, less, let's say, mathematization than the natural sciences. So what is special about the sciences, specifically the natural sciences? Well, one account of what is special about the natural sciences is that they deal in causal explanation. For instance, we might explain a train derailment by saying the tracks on which the train was running warped because of heat due to the sun in extreme weather conditions. Okay. Is it the case that all natural sciences give causal explanations? Well, an interesting counterexample is given by the theory of continental drift, which was first developed in 1912 by Alfred Wegener. Um, on this graphic, you will see that all the continents were together as if they were part of one giant jigsaw puzzle. Wegener's theory was that at one point, the continents were in just such a formation as we see in this picture, and then they drifted apart. But the problem for Wegener, while he had some evidence for his theory, in particular, he noticed that the, the different continents seemed to fit together in a jigsaw puzzle kind of way, and he noticed similarity in fossils on each side of the Atlantic coast, the east coast of South America and the west coast of Africa. Nevertheless, his theory at the time was not accepted because he could give no clear causal mechanism. In fact, the idea sounded absurd. How could things as gigantic as continents drift apart? Later on, in the 50s and 60s, his theory became much more accepted with the advent of plate tectonics, which explained that the land masses were actually kind of plates with another level beneath them on which they can be, in some sense, riding. In particular, when we had the advent of GPS satellites, we could actually come and measure the degrees of continental drift, small though they were. So we might claim that the case of Wegener shows that the mere lack of a causal mechanism does not rule a theory out as non-scientific. Also, if we emphasize causal mechanisms in particular, we have no account of what makes for formal sciences and what makes possibly for the human sciences, because they often deal in theories that fail to give causal mechanisms. An alternative account of what is special about the sciences in general, and the natural sciences in particular, is that they issue in theories that are in some sense testable. Now the crucial question is, what do we mean by testable? One version of testability was given by the philosopher Karl Popper. He claimed that what is special about the natural sciences in particular is that they're testable by observational evidence in the following sense. Any good scientific theory is specific enough to rule out the possibility of certain observations. For instance, consider Kepler's first law of planetary motion. Kepler claimed that all the planets traveled in elliptical orbits with the sun as one foci of the orbits. Well, that would rule out, for instance, finding a planet at one point here, 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 and then at another time way up there someplace. Right. So Kepler's theory rules out certain possibilities. And Popper said that is of the essence of science. Scientific theories rule out certain possibilities. That is to say they are falsifiable. That's not to say they're false but as I say, they're falsifiable in the sense that we can tell what observations would show them to be false. Popper used his theory of falsifiability to critique theories that were very common in his day, including theories advocated by friends of his who were Marxists and Freudians. These friends in particular would often advocate for their theories, claiming that their theories could explain every set of circumstance possible. They could explain all phenomena. It was Popper's insight to see that what they considered to be the strongest virtue of their theories, that they could explain all kinds of phenomena, was in fact the vice. 
that a good scientific theory rules out certain possibilities so that if those possibilities were to occur, we would know the theory to be false. But the point he raised against his Freudian friends was that they could explain any human behaviour possible. Everything seemed to fit into their theory. This, he claimed, was a vice, not, as they saw it, a virtue. Nevertheless, there are severe shortcomings with Popper's theory. Because Popper claimed that while you could falsify a theory, no amount of evidence would positively give reason for believing the theory to be true. For instance, the observation of a planet continuing in an elliptical orbit gave you absolutely no reason to believe it would continue in that elliptical orbit. This was what Popper called his rejection of inductivism. More plausibly, we might take Popper's notion of testing a theory. We might say that once a theory has passed a test, that is, from the theory we have deduced an observation and then checked to see if the observation is true, the fact that it has passed the test gives us some, though not conclusive, reason to believe the theory is true. I have suggested so far that one mark of the difference between science and non-science is testability. Testability in the natural sciences, I have suggested, comes from observational evidence. But what about testability in the formal sciences? There we might think the relevant notion of testability is proof, formal proof from axioms, the derivations of theorems from axioms by deductive means. And then what are the human sciences? The human sciences seem to afford neither tests by proofs from axioms, nor often do they seem to allow testability by observational consequences. An alternative line would be to claim that the human sciences provide a different kind of framework and testability raises different issues. One quality we might ascribe to the human sciences is that they provide a certain kind of narrative fit, and in this lies their testability. To give an example, in the early 20th century, Freud proposed various theories of psychoanalysis. And one thing his theory did was try to explain how a vast amount of phenomena, seemingly disparate phenomena that did not fit in together, could belong to one coherent narrative. For instance, Freud, in his book Studies in Hysteria, co-written with his colleague Breuer, Freud gave the case of Anna O. Anna o was a patient who was hydrophobic, meaning she couldn't drink water, even though she would often honestly profess to have a desire for water. When it was presented to her, she absolutely refused to drink it. Here we see a kind of anomaly she has an express interest and desire to drink water and an absolute inability to drink it when presented with the water. How do we make these pieces fit together? Freud suggested we add an extra piece to the puzzle. He said she has a repressed trauma. The trauma he envisaged in this case was a particular trauma that happened when she was a child with a particular incident with water. The trauma he got her to recollect was a particular event when she was a child when her governess let her lapdog drink from her water glass. So Anna O oh was allegedly revolted by the sight of the governess's lapdog sharing a glass of water with the governess. But because she was only a child, the governess was a figure of authority. She, was, she did not feel able to voice, to express her revulsion, and so she suppressed it. Indeed, according to Freud, she suppressed the whole event of the lapdog. This is a kind of mini-trauma for Anna O. Oh. So Freud's claim is that while she had consciously forgotten this traumatic event, each time she was presented with water, there was an unconscious memory and revival of this trauma, and that led to her inability to actually accept the water and to drink it. I'm not claiming that Freud's theory is correct, but I do think it's an interesting case of explanation in the human sciences, where Freud gives us an extra piece to create a narrative which makes pieces that seem incompatible fit together in a nice, coherent narrative. So in conclusion, what makes for a theory being scientific? Is it that scientific theories deal in causal explanations? Or is it, is it that they are testable? I would suggest, in fact, we stop looking for an essence of scientificality, 
but rather concentrate on the idea that there are different scientific virtues, different virtues scientific theories can have. One virtue is the virtue of giving causal explanations, causal mechanisms. A virtue, for a long time, Wegener's continental drift theory sadly lacked, but was eventually supplied by plate tectonic theory. Another virtue is testability by observational means. And another virtue is being able to make compatible a wide ranging of initially seeming incompatible phenomena. We might then find that questions about what counts as science and what does not count as science really come down to which virtues we seem to take to be the most important. And we'll find that different people on different sides of the debates about different alleged sciences or non-sciences actually emphasize different virtues over other virtues. My personal preference as a virtue is testability by observational means, but I would say that is specifically for the natural sciences. Thank you.